Welcome to this panel of Indigenous Women's Voices as a means of reconciliation and healing. We're, we're holding this panel as a faction of one of the uh, functions of the Association of Canadian Women Composers, uh, 40th anniversary, and we're so thrilled to have you all here. I want to quickly say uh, a hi to the person who's been chairing the uh, 40th uh, ACWC 40th committee. Uh, Diane, would you like to say hi? Diane Berry. Hi, I'm Diane Berry. I'm the chair of the anniversary committee. I'm out here on the West Coast on the unceded traditional lands of the Algonquin people. And I, this is the third in our series of panels. And it's been wonderful ways to connect and learn more about each other. And I know everyone is really looking forward to hearing the wise and wonderful wor words and song, songs, maybe plural, from these women and thank them very much for giving of their time. And I'm going to pass it back to Carol and she'll do the more introductions. Okay, I, I want to claim um, my own roots being uh, the country of, of Pocahontas and Powhatan, which we in the state of Virginia took gladly and unfortunately. So the rest of our lives, we're paying back to them. We're also paying back to the uh, first, uh, to the uh, people that we brought over as colonists, which would be the Africans. So I'm uh, wishing to say that all of us are, have many human debts to pay and much gratitude for those that have waited until we're ready to say thank you to them. Um, that's meager and not enough, but I'm going to right away introduce uh, Kelly Larilla, who's going to sing for us. Thank you, Carol. Um, so I was asked to sing a, a song. It's an Anishinaabe uh, song, and it's a, a woman's honor song called Anishinaabe Kwe. And so I would like to um, to gift this song to our panelists, to uh, Carol for reaching out to us, and to welcome um, those on the call as well. So I'm going to start with it it uh it's you know honor songs are signaled with um with special single beats at the beginning so there'll be four of those beats and the song goes for uh four push-ups and uh so um so yeah, when i when i sing songs it's to me it's 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 like prayers and giving thanks so
church. You're muted, Carol. Just uh... so sorry. Thank you so much, Kelly. Touching. I want to first thank Tina Pearson, who's a member of the Association of Women Composers, whose idea this was. She had it years ago. We're finally coming through with it. So Tina out there, wherever you are. I want to introduce the members of the, the panel. Jean Becker, who's Inuk. She's the founder of the Good Hearted Women Singers Singing and Drumming Group and is Senior Director of the Indigenous Initiatives at University of Waterloo many other things one could say. Beverly McIver is a Nishnabi, and she is a composer, member of our association, and an educator, and again, many more things. Karen Sunabaka, Métis, uh, a, a composer and professor at University of Waterloo through Conrad Grable. And Kelly, who you just, Kelly Lorilla, who you just heard. Sami, a song keeper, and also was a member of the Good Hearted Women uh, with a PhD. She's a lecturer at Renaissance University of Waterloo School of Social Work. Uh, so we're going to ask each of these people to talk about their, their experiences, both growing up and also how their song has become a means of, of reconciliation and healing and uh, storytelling as well. So Jean Becker, let's turn to you. Thank you so much, Carol. Ani, Ojo, Sego, Scano, Tansi, Wache, Kwe Kwe. Hello, everyone. I am Jean Becker. I am Inuk from Nunatsiavut in Labrador. I am a grandmother an educator. Currently, I am the Associate Vice President Indigenous Relations at the University of Waterloo. I grew up um, in a small isolated community in central Labrador. My mom had nine children. My father was a trapper, a hunter, a fisherman, and an electrician. Um, I was born in a time of great change in Labrador a few years after the end of the Second World War, during which time the outside world changed my homelands forever by building military bases and radar sites across our territory, ending the years of almost solely relying on the land and introducing a wage labor economy. So I left home at the age of 17. I traveled around the US for about a decade before moving to Southern Ontario, where I have now lived for over 40 years. So being far from home, I became a part of the urban indigenous community and began working with other indigenous women with roots from different parts of Canada to build an Indigenous community in our region. After spending eight years as a Volkswagen mechanic, I started to worry about my old age and uh, I decided I needed a job with a pension. So I decided to go to university. So I first undertook a BA and followed that with a master's degree in anthropology at the University of um, Guelph. At university, I set out to educate myself in all things Indigenous. At the same time, I had discovered elders and knowledge keepers in our area, and I started to learn from them and to attend ceremonies. My closest ties are with the Anishinaabek and Cree people in Ontario and Manitoba. 
And I am so grateful for the teachings I have received from both and so grateful to be included in ceremony with them as I have been for the past 30 or so years. I was given the responsibility about 20 years ago of carrying a sweat lodge and until 2020 <laughs> conducted regular ceremonies on the land. You know, Inuit people have historically used beautiful, large hand drums, but they had disappeared in Labrador, replaced by brass bands and country and Western music by the time I was born. They were only reintroduced to our region long after I left home. The um, first drums that spoke to me personally was when I attended a powwow many years ago at the New Credit First Nation in Ontario. I remember walking towards the arbor through the trees when I heard them. And I was um, completely surprised to find myself suddenly unable to hold back tears at the sound. It was like that sound pierced my heart and took me somewhere I didn't know. From that moment, I knew the drums had a power to heal, to return some part of my being that I had not known was missing. The beauty of the culture and the people was represented for me in the sound of those big drums. I soon learned that men sat at the drums and were a gift to them from the women a long, long time ago. The story I, I was told was this. A young woman saw that the men were always at war, that life was hard and sad for the people. And she was worried about that, concerned, and she thought a lot about it. And Eventually, she was given a vision of this big drum and told to make one and to give it to the men to help them to make peace and learn how to live together in a good way. In um, 2003, when I was working as an Aboriginal coordinator in a university providing services for Indigenous students and trying to initiate programs to encourage cultural practices, I thought of drums and the potential to use them to bring the women in the university and the community together. And by that time, I had met women who were in hand drum groups, and I was lucky enough to find one in our community who was a singer. Um, in the interests of complete disclosure, I must tell you, I'm tone deaf and can't sing, but I was determined to establish the first women's drum group in our community. So I asked this woman, Barb Waterfall, to help me to, to do that and to come and teach women, including myself, to drum and sing. So our group began with a small handful of women and slowly we established a regular group who met weekly to sing and drum together. So over the years, I saw many women find their voices in that circle and gain confidence, not only in singing, but also in speaking for themselves. Many times women said to me that they loved their drums. They loved the group and it brought them healing. Many of them brought children who watched and they learned and then they joined the circle. So we tried to work together to remember what, that what we were doing was ceremony, was sacred and to give every person a chance to lead and to follow. We created a practice of lighting seven candles at each session, representing the seven sacred teachings of um, love, respect, courage, honesty, humility, wisdom, and truth, and began each session with smudging. 
I experienced healing, reconciliation, and partnership in that circle. Nakumit. Thank you so much, Jean. I'm sure we'll we'll come back for for more from from you later on. And without trying to comment, I'll go straight to to Beverly, Beverly McIver. Over to you. Thank you, Carolyn. Bozoani, Beverly Nadishnikaz, Obishkokang Donjaba, Marwa Donda. I'm originally from Northwestern Ontario. My uh, family is from Laxo First Nation and more specifically a community called Frenchman's Head, which is uh, Laxo First Nation is located close to Sulacout, which is off the Trans-Canada Highway, about maybe a half an hour off the highway. Uh, I was uh, adopted at the age of four, and I grew up in Dryden, which is about an hour from Sulacote. <clears throat> it is on the Trans-Canada Highway. It's a pulp and paper town. I was there until I was uh, about 19, and then I traveled east to uh, Cornwall, Kingston, Toronto, and now I live in Ottawa. I've lived here for 30 years on unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, my family is uh, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe. I didn't really start to make those connections with my uh, background and ancestry until I was in my late 20s and then more so once, once my daughter was born since I wanted to find out who I, I really was. And ironically, I think I had to, I had to leave my ancestral territory in order to get to know more about my, my culture and my family. So it was really in Toronto, where we lived for about five years, that I met Indigenous people. I think Dryden is very much two solitudes. There's the indigenous community and the, and the non-indigenous community. Uh, I was an only child and I, we lived in the country, so I really didn't mix too much with, uh, with uh, I guess, other, other children. I was uh, pretty much a loner and I certainly didn't have any contact with indigenous people even though there's a number of reserves around the Dryden area. Um, so I started playing piano when I was about eight, taking piano lessons. And music was very much my, my solace. As I mentioned, I was an only child, so playing piano was what I did. And it was also something that uh, if I was practicing, then I didn't have to do the dishes. So there was another big incentive for me to, to, to play the, the piano and, and work hard at it. My lessons stopped when I was about 16. My teacher retired and uh, that was pretty much the end of lessons for me, but I tried desperately to play as much as I could even after I left, left home, went to college and uh, still kept playing, even though I didn't have a piano of my own until I got my first job. Uh, and since then, I've, been, I've played as a church musician. Uh, I've played for, for students uh, and uh, volunteer pianist in a number of capacities. So I had a career as a computer programmer, oddly enough. And I, I was laid off in 2014. And at that time, I decided that I was going to go all out and pursue music as a career. I wasn't had no plans to go back to my my previous career. So I decided to become a, a, a piano teacher. And uh, I went to Univers uh, University of Ottawa 
in the piano pedagogy program. And about the same time, I became a composer. Uh, just because I, I wanted, I was hanging out with people who were also composing and uh, I wanted to try it out myself and learn more about it. So in, in terms of the, the theme, I'm going to talk about uh, my works and, and how they relate to healing and reconciliation and partnership. So as I've already mentioned, music was, has always been a source of healing for me, playing piano, listening to music, studying music. Uh, I've done all those things all my life. Uh, composing, I, I believe, let me explore a lot of the things that I was trying to learn about my, my culture and uh, uh, my heritage. The first piece that I composed uh, was a suite of pieces, actually, and what I wanted to do was was explore the story of Manoman, which is wild rice in Ojibwe. So there's a lot of, it's kind of a central part of Anishinaabe heritage, uh, the relationship to, to the plant and to the history of the Ojibwe people themselves, since they, the story goes um, that uh, the Ojibwe people were on the on the East Coast and had to travel to where the Monoman grows in order to survive as a people. So I explored that musically. And part of that, so healing in the sense that I've always loved Monoman and wild rice. Uh, as, a, as a child, it was popular food in, in uh, Dryden and the surrounding area because it's quite abundant and uh, there were people that were harvesting it. <clears throat> it also helped me explore my relationship with Anishinaabe people and exploring some of their, their central uh, narratives. It, it also helped me explore my relationship with the land and growing up in that area. Uh, one thing that happened to Laxo First Nation is that it was flooded in order to create a hydro dam. So a lot of the Monoman beds were, were lost. And uh, fortunately for me, I grew up uh, in a family that, that went hunting and fishing and uh, picking berries. So I did grow up with some sense of connection to my ancestral territory. So I'm very thankful for that. Also, uh, Learning Ojibwe language has been part of my life for maybe the past, oh, I'm gonna say like 15 years when I started taking Ojibwe language classes. I'm f very far from uh, fluent. I, it's kind of a on and off again thing, you know, I'll study for a little while and, and uh, maybe take a few classes and I've got loads of books and materials. So from time to time I'll pursue language. Uh, the next uh, piece that I, I was very fortunate to take part in was a, a work called Odabanag, which was commissioned by Jumblies and, uh, and Soundstreams in Toronto. And that was a joint project that I did with my, my daughter, Melody McIver, who is also a composer and a musician. So the, the, that work was based on the, on the words of three elders who Melody interviewed, and it, it's mostly dealing with residential school. So before residential school, during res residential school, and uh, the aftermath of residential school. So there were three elders involved in that project, Garnet Anjakoneb, Josephine King, and Tom Chisel, and they're all from the Laxo First Nation area. So that really allowed me to, to delve into our family history, because my mother went to Cecilia Jeffrey's residential school. And uh, so I had the opportunity to, to connect with, with these elders from my own area, which was uh, very profound for me. So it's a great source of healing and reconciliation, I think, with, with, with the past and what had happened. Uh, 
to uh, survivors of resi residential school. Uh, in in that work, I in one of the pieces, I actually have Ojibwe, uh, I guess, sort of translations of the of of uh, Garnet's Garnet's word and stories and what what's happening in the in the music. Uh, in Josephine's story, Josephine King's story, was about what happened at residential school and. It was it's very much about resistance and uh, resourcefulness and survival. And the, the last piece by Tom Chisel is a, is a story, it's a community story about how two boys escaped from the Shinguak Residential School and made their way across the Lake Superior in a sailboat that they had stolen. And somehow they miraculously managed to arrive back home along the way, you know, through their own wits and, and meeting people that helped them along the way. So it's a very beautiful story. So I really love that connection to a community story and, uh, you know, to, to their descendants who still tell the story. So it's, I, I feel that that story is really about changing the narrative. So um, there's a lot of stories about people who didn't survive and didn't make it, but there, there are some stories about people who, who, uh, who did. And uh, so that was a very wonderful project to work on. Uh, my most recent project was, it's called Canadian Floral Emblems. And it's, I wrote a piece for each floral emblem for each province and territory and they're, they're piano solos. So partly wrote those so that I'd have something to play because <laughs> I, I was getting asked for um, pieces that I, my own pieces in concert and I didn't have anything that I could play. So there I'm, I was really looking at relationship to the land because some of the flowers are familiar to me from my childhood. But I also was was very fortunate to listen to the stories of other people and reasons why they were uh, located in, in, maybe they grew up in one of the provinces that the flower uh, was located. And I got to hear stories about uh, their own um, experience with the land and immigration stories, stories of hardship. And uh, things like ecology and why those plants are important. And finally, I am working on a joint project with uh, my friend Deborah Grass, who is also a piano teacher and a composer. And we have a bit of shared history in that we went to the same school and we, uh, we crossed paths, but we didn't really connect with each other until we, we found out that we met at a piano teacher's uh, event and we found out that we had known each other back in college, had pursued the same career, had worked for the same company, and we were just like two ships passing. But then we finally connect as piano teachers. So we agreed to to work on this project and, and Deborah was the one who introduced it, who asked me to uh, collaborate with her because she's the descendant of United Empire Loyalists. And uh, she wanted to explore our different uh, perspectives with, with respect to living in Canada and everything that that history entails. So that is uh, a project that is very much connected with reconciliation. And I'm really happy to have that partnership with Deborah. So that's my, uh, how, how I think that music relates to Healing Reconciliation Partnership. Thank you so much, Beverly. So much to, to think about. And we'll have you back. Uh, let's move on right away to Karen Sunabaka, uh, uh, who uh, just go to you, okay. Karen. Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
<clears throat> so Tansei Karen Nitsikasan, uh, Winnipeg Kayate Ochinia. So I'm a member of the Manitoba Metis Federation, and I grew up in Treaty One territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Ininoak, Anishinoak, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Metis Nation. I, uh, like that says, I grew up in Winnipeg. Um, my I always find it helpful to talk about my grandparents when I talk about my her heritage. So on my dad's side, they are Finnish and Swedish. On my mum's side, my mother, my grandmother is Métis and I will talk about her a lot. She was very influential in my in my life and, in, and she's very uh, present in my music. Uh, and then my grandfather on my mother's side was Scottish, um, the uh, son of settlers. Um, so growing up in Winnipeg, you are kind of in the middle of the uh, Red River settlement um, and ve very many people there are Red River Métis. Um, and I really feel like I didn't, I always knew I was Red River Métis and it was because of my grandmother, my Métis grandmother, because she had to, she didn't know about it until, she didn't know she was Métis, even though she was actually growing up on a farm, on a Métis farm. Uh, near Selkirk, just outside of Selkirk, um, and her family had owned land um, and uh, her uh, in the Red River settlement from about the 1800s. So, um, but it had been hidden um, because when in 1870, when Manitoba joined Confederation, uh, it was quite violent. Um, at the time and I go on I, I just gave a talk so I feel like I'm I, I, I don't want to talk for an hour I only want to talk for 10 minutes so um, but what happened was the especially the English Métis and that is my heritage English Métis were able because they were Protestant and were in English parishes they could for the most part say they were English or Scottish and um, avoid a lot of the violence that was happening especially in Winnipeg so um, as I was growing up, of course, I had a father who was uh, very much into uh, classical music. And so I played the piano. I started on piano, but very soon went to the cello, which you can see. Uh, and so I was taking classical cello. Then we'd go to my grandparents' farm, which was uh, just a fantastic place. I still miss that place where it was really a gathering for the Métis community. My aunties were all there. Um, my great aunties were there um, and uh, and pretty much everyone in the area I was related to either on my settler side or, or my Métis side and they had incredible parties. My, there was always fiddle music on. Um, my grandfather, even though he was um, Scottish and a settler, he found a lot of healing within the Métis community because they looked after each other there. Um, and that's uh, actually a piece I want to explore um, coming up um, in the next few years, just about my grandfather's relationship with uh, my great grandfather, Alex. We call my mom and I call him Alex the Elder, but his name was Alexander Burston. Um, so, uh, so I always, I never really thought about this, but the farm was the place where I, I actually was, I would fiddle with my grandfather. So I, I, even though I wasn't a violinist, I was a cellist, I actually learned to play the fiddle and I could fiddle with my grandparents. Um, my grandmother played the piano. She um, kind of laid the foundations. Um, and any time I was at the farm when we were dancing around and dancing the night away, my grandmother was always telling us that we were Métis. She says, you were Métis, you're as Métis as Louis Riel, you have a responsibility. Um, and my brother, my sister and I all, you, you, you're you a kid, you don't really think about what that means. And it's really been in the last 10 years that I've really kind of taken up my grandmother's call about what it means to be Métis. So I did my uh, my undergrad at the University of Manitoba. For the most part, I just was thinking about classical music. I teach music and theory, music theory and composition now, um, and I went all the way through my three level my three degrees. Um, so starting at University of Manitoba, uh, getting uh, my undergrad in composition and and cello. I did cello as well. My master's in California um, and my PhD at UC Davis. So my master's was at, was at San Francisco State University. Um, and a lot of the time through that period, I was really looking at women's voices. So I wasn't thinking so much about my heritage at the time. Um, it was always kind of part of what I did, but I was really interested in, especially being in a, in a, in a, in a world where composers so often are male. Um, 
I was really thinking about what is our woman's voices. And so then when I started to compose after finishing my PhD, I was really looking at the woman's voices in my family and the strongest one was my Métis grandmother. Uh, and so I in 2015, I started a work about my grandmother called Mama's Painting Louis Riel's Dream. And it's really a collaborative piece with, it's the first time I really collaborated with my mother, Joyce Clouston, who, um, was, who wrote about her mom and it was really at that point somewhat of a healing time for me my mom struggled with situational depression um in and around uh just a little bit before that before i wrote that piece and so um part of dealing with sort of mental illness that did happen in our family i would bring that into my music um, but also then bringing in, uh, exploring my grandmother's story and the, and the story of the Métis people, first in this piece, um, Mama's Painting the Real's Dream, but also in previous pieces that I wrote um, um, for the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra. Um, so I, and so on top of that too, um, I also would explore uh, mental illness, which actually comes from my settler side. So in, in, at the family farm, the family stories that we often told and the people that were really suffering in our family were our, was the settler side of our family who had a history of mental illness, starting really with my great, great grandmother, Matilda. Um, and so to really explore that, I looked at her story in a piece of music called Never to Return, which I worked on. Um, and I feel like right now I'm just in the midst of all this. So my mom and I have been working on a bunch of projects together uh, that look at um, our history, but also our history to Cree, the, the local Cree communities, because we know that that we have um, that are the the woman and our sort of my great grandmothers and my great great grandmothers were Cree. So we've started learning Cree together and we um, are are working with Cree elders uh, very regularly. Um, and are starting to look at relationships with land because at the family farm also that was just so much a part of of life there um, and the time and with my grandmother and grandfather at that family farm um, so it is continuing I don't know if I want to say too much more because um, I feel like I am running a bit out of time but I think maybe the last thing I'll say is that um, the healing part for me has really been the opportunity to i mean when you're composing a piece it's like a research project right you're gathering you're gathering stories so talking with my mom and we talk my mom and i now um, i used to of course fly to winnipeg but lately it's been we've just been talking over zoom on a weekly basis and we have a few projects that are looking at sort of different stories um and it is both the healing of the relationship between my mom and I in some ways and, and her healing after being um, with her situational depression and she's really um, so there's that part of it but also we're sitting sometimes in our family being Métis we sit in this intersection so I do feel strong connections to my Métis side but also my Scottish family and I've been to Scotland I've been to Sweden I've been to Finland so I've been to all these places so I, I, I feel like there's sometimes I understand I sit in this intersection of all these cultures and sometimes this creates conflicts within myself and I find that it's within my music that I start to explore these cons these 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 conflicts and these clashes and I kind of can enjoy that dissonance in those things and I and and then but then I can also then um, enjoy the beauty that I find um, in all of those places so and the beauty of the prairies of course and that homeland that the the Red River settlement and the, the Winnipeg and Selkirk areas will always be this this grounding place for me this home and and it's where from my grandmother used to take us to all these you know events um, especially powwows and things like that and for me that drum hearing um that drum for me just feels like the heartbeat and so uh, there's this grounding that i have this heartbeat of the land um and this heartbeat of my heritage so i'm going to end there You're still muted, Carol. <laughs> I thought so. Sorry. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, you said so much. We appreciate everything you, you brought together for us. And now we'll go to Kelly. 
Colleen Larilla. All Thank yours. You. Thank you, Carol. Um, so, Boade and greetings. Um, I, as introduced at the beginning, I'm Indigenous uh, Sami and Irish, and so all settler. And um, I want to acknowledge that, you know, I was born on, uh, in Northern Ontario on Treaty 61 territory, um, the territory of the Anishinaabe and the Cree peoples. And it's also the treaty title of the Robinson Huron Treaty. And um, my grandfather, who was Sami, and he was born in Northern Finland, and he came over in the 1920s. And uh, he was a colonized man himself. And the Sami people have also experienced uh, residential schools, um, you know, as part of the colonizing project there. But when he came here, um, he became part of the colonizing project here in, in Canada. And so I've inherited um, that colonial, the colonizing part, and also the Indigenous piece. And so I guess the more I learn about, you know, this land and, uh, and Indigenous peoples and my own identity, I feel like it's, it's, it's a responsibility of mine to contribute to, to justice in ways that I can yeah, in my life where I am. And now I live in Southern Ontario on the Haldeman Track Treaty. Uh, this is the treaty territory uh, that encompasses six miles on either side of the Grand River from the mouth to the base. And it was, um, this land was actually granted by um, uh, British General Frederick Haldeman. And it was to the Haudenosaunee people to give basically thanks for their help in um, participating and helping the British in the American Revolution. Um, but that treaty was never fully honored. In fact, the Haudenosaunee people only have 4.9% uh, of that original territory. And this land also is the traditional territories of, um, of the Chinantan and the Anishinaabe peoples too. So my learning about the land and, and, uh, and the people continues. Um, so, the drum circle, I facilitated uh, Mino Odequa Wak Nagamawak, the good hearted women singers for the past 17 years. Our drum circle actually just closed at the beginning of COVID and just um, it lived a good life. And, um, and just, you know, over the years we've had, you know, many different uh, indigenous peoples and some settler peoples too, who wanted to um, you know, be with the drum and, and, and be in community with Indigenous people and to learn um, from and with them. And so people have moved away and um, sadly some individuals have passed away. And, um, and so it was probably time. And uh, the drum circle was passed to me by uh, Jean, Jean Becker. And um, I don't know that I was ever ready to accept that drum circle. I'm, I'm not a singer. And um, I can still remember the first time, um, actually a friend of mine uh, asked me to come to drum and I said, oh, thanks, but no thanks. And, um, and she kind of convinced me to come. And uh, as I got familiar with the songs, I had asked, you know, um, for a song, could someone sing this song? And Jean, I still remember it, but Jean said, oh, you're going to lead it. <laughs> uh, so that was an introduction to, to leading songs. And so I, you know, when she passed this drum circle really 17 years ago, um, I took her teachings to heart and tried to do things in very much the same way that, that she taught me and that we follow those teachings of the seven sacred teachings that she talked about. Um, and again, that they are truth and love, respect, courage, honesty, humility, and wisdom. And each week we would burn those candles. Sometimes we had um, what we call grandmothers and grandfathers or little, our, our little rocks. 
and uh, they're the oldest beings in all of creation. Um, and so they would have the names of those teachings on them. But each week, the, um, you know, the women and girls would either light a candle or they would uh, hold that particular um, grandfather or grandmother rock and talk about what that teaching meant to them. So over the years, we, you know, you know, it was so beautiful to hear little children talk about, well, what is, what is love and, or truth? And, and yet, you know, there was always something in there for us adults to learn uh, from the children and the youth. And uh, so I really appreciated that. But those teachings really etched, I think, in my heart and soul in terms of how to live those teachings. And they ended up being significant um, in partnerships that we did over the years. You know, our drum circle was never, I don't know if we ever consciously thought that, oh, we're going to start singing in public because we were starting to have people ask us to sing. They would hear about us and ask if we could sing. And I think, um, be, you know, it, I had a lot to learn. And uh and I realized in the beginning that sometimes choirs would ask us to sing or, or different organizations, and we became the entertainment. And, um, and I realized after a while that it actually didn't feel good. It didn't feel good to sing when we were the entertainment, because we walked away feeling like, I don't think we knew them, and they definitely didn't know us. And, um, and so gradually, as my thinking changed and my learning improved, that I realized that partnerships needed to be mutual, that there was something that each of us could, could uh, learn from each other and benefit from each other. So there was a lot more discussions. And, you know, and even when you've had discussions, I realized that you know, people can make assumptions, including me. Um, you know, I remember a, a circumstance where we were, did a whole bunch of preparation for an event and uh, we were singing with another, with a choir and uh, we were talking about how we would sing together and which songs we were singing together and what would be different. And I remember that um, we even talked about singing in a circle on the stage at a particular um, performance place in town. And um, it never occurred to me to ask, is there gonna be anything in the middle of the circle? Because in my mind, there's nothing in the middle. And so I, if I was operating from my, my worldview and how I think about things, when we sing in circle, all we have is our sacred bundle in the middle of the circle, like the smudge and all of that. And um, I realized that the choir was probably assuming there would be a piano in the center. And so that's, that piano ended up creating a bit of a, a disconnect between us singing, because we were all in a circle around the piano but we all couldn't see each other because the piano was in the way. And so it's a bit, it was a teaching, you know, that um, even when we think we assume we may need to go back and revisit and go, okay, so here's how I envision the setup. So that was a, a you know, and I think when we're willing to stay in those partnerships and work out those, um, those moments that come up, because we don't know, uh, we don't know what we don't know. And we won't know until we, you know, engage with people. And, and I was told, you know, um, by another elder, you know, about learning how to listen and listening how to learn. And so it's kind of a two-part Have we lost you, Kelly? <clears throat> so 
So I'll just continue. Somehow the Zoom just uh, went away on me. <laughs> um, so um, our drum circle was singing for six years with a police chorus. And, um, and it was never an intention to do it, but it, it actually happened through a conversation that just happened one day with me and, and a representative from the police uh, chorus. And we did it for six years. So my research ended up being about is actually talking with the women and girls of our drum circle and talking with uh, the men of the, the white settler men of the police chorus. And I say it like that because their identities represent a lot of power and patriarchy power in our society, which is quite different than what indigenous women and girls represent in our society. And, um, and so it was a learning process through that six years. And, um, but I was interested in what has, what was able to sustain us during that partnership, partnership, especially when you consider the extraordinary violence that is ongoing with regard to police violence against Indigenous people, particularly against Indigenous women and girls. And so it wasn't planned this way, but I heard in the stories from the women and girls and from the men for different reasons, that those seven sacred teachings came up again. So they provide the ethical reasons or the ethics for how people can engage with one another, especially for people who don't understand each other, where there's been a lot of animosity. I don't think we can go into thinking about solutions or even what reconciliation is without establishing how are we actually gonna engage with one another in a way that is, um, is respecting each other and, um, and that there's genuine engagement and that each, each partner is willing to um, move off the comfort level, so to speak, in terms of being willing to uh, meet in a space that works for everyone. And uh, so maybe I will uh, end there. Thank you for listening. Thank you so very much, Kelly. I uh, hope uh, the little glitch that some of us experienced with, with the cyber stuff um, only put us closer into the touch with the real spirits. But thank you. I, I can't believe what, what words you have all said. Uh, we have a few moments. We need to end in a few more uh, for questions. Um, is there anybody who would like to ask something specific of anyone? Raise your hand or do one of those little things that you do on, on Zoom to say that you want to talk. If not, I might call on somebody. <laughs> hey, everyone. Oh, sorry. I see someone else raising their hand. Go ahead. Um, Tyler, go first. I saw you first. Um, OK, all I'll right. Brief. Uh, yes, uh, my question is, uh, well, I thought of this question when um, Karen was talking about composing music. And I was just thinking about what may carry over into the music you create and what what gets lost in translation um, and and also just questions about like writing <laughs> music or creating in a place and and then carrying that and sharing that with maybe others in a different place I hope there's something translatable in all that I just asked but I'd be happy yeah. to refer it I mean, it's interesting. I I give I have to kind of give up my music in some ways um, when I'm done it. And, and actually, I don't ever feel like I'm done. I have to like let it go because <laughs> it's due um, and I've got it as close as I can get it. But I really feel that like it's where I come from and I can tell people where I'm coming from, but I can't predict how people are going to receive it. And people can experience it differently because of their own experiences. So as much as it's a very much a healing process for me, um, it may be something different for someone else. Um, although, I mean, I didn't talk about the effects, this one piece I wrote, Never to Return, which was about mental illness and about um, uh, my great-great-grandmother who lost children. I didn't kind of get into this, but she, 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 
she ended up losing two children during a, a flu and, and just never could believe that they were dead and never could cope with that. Um, so uh, that one, it was, I did depict like it, she was screaming and someone like in the middle of it, like there is this moment where it's just, you know, your heart is being torn apart. And I did, someone did say to me that she had never heard a piece that depicted the loss of a child like that before. Um, and so she experienced it, what kind of what I was trying to depict, but that isn't always true. And I think that's a rare occasion um, for that to actually happen. And I'm okay with that as a composer, I, I, because unless there's text, if there's text, then you can, it can help some ways. But, but other than that, I, I kind of let it go and let it be for people what it needs to be. Some people won't like it. Some people will. So, yeah. Susan, go for it. Um, Susan Frickberg, you had a question? Oh, I do. And I'm really from New Zealand. I'm just stuck over here in Australia because of the pandemic. So I just thought I'd... <laughs> um, <laughs> I just really um, resonated with Kelly when she talked about the partnership aspect of a performance. And I just, as opposed to like entertainment. And I just wondered, Kelly, if you could just talk a little bit more about that. Thank you for asking that, Susan. Um, so literally, sometimes people would say, yeah, for example, you know, we're having a, a meeting or sometimes a church meeting. Um, and so we're over lunch. Could you come and sing? So that was sort of the depiction of entertainment. And so there was not an expressed interest in wanting to know us, except maybe marveling in the idea that it was an Indigenous drum circle and so asking for that and um and but i recognize that people may not have known that what they were asking was offensive and so i gradually over time was when people would ask that i would um i would explain to them that um you know that we're looking more in a relationship sharing or can i give you more information about our drum circles can i speak to that who we are what we're about and if they said well we only have about 15 minutes for you then i would probably say okay i don't think we can do that but thank you anyways and uh so people so I recognize that not everybody was at a space where they were, were realizing what they were asking of us. And, and then even when I tried to explain, they may not have always been um, interested. And so, yeah, and they were hard conversations to have over time. And, uh, and not everybody was uh, receptive to that. But I also found other people that were very much um, wanting to follow my lead so to speak and to have meetings and talk about it and they'd say well how do you envision this happening so even the whole schedule was planned with with uh, me and sometimes other individuals from our drum circle so people learn to not come already to the table with something already planned out yeah that was probably the biggest one thank you uh I'm, I'm torn. I'd like to go on for another hour. Uh, it's unfair to those who got other plans. Uh, I suggest if you have questions, you write them to me. I think you all have my email. And if you have questions that should go to individuals, let, let me know and I'll send them to that individual. Uh, any one last really burning question? We'll go one minute over time. Oh, okay, Wend yeah. Wendelin. Oh, yeah. Okay. This isn't really a question, but just a kind of request to, um, uh, to this has just been so wonderful. I feel like we've just dipped our toes in the water and I'm wondering if there's a way to, to uh, go further with this, this dialogue, this conversation. And I think we're all, I mean, I don't, I can't speak for everybody, obviously, but it feels like there's like, there's a lot, a lot of energy around this and I would love to see something evolve from this. That's fantastic. Maybe uh, I could ask each of you to send in your, your uh, if you would like to be part of this, give me your, your email and let's get something going on email at least. Is that good, Wendland? And, and uh, then yes. we can figure out if we'd have a, some more conversations. I agree yeah. with you. We, we can't let this die. It's, it's sparked all of our attention. I see Tina there. I don't know if you were here when I thanked you for having given us the ideas of 
I'm talking like this. Um, I see so many people would love to just spend all my time saying thank you for being here. Um, thank you to each of you, to Jean, to, to Karen, to Beverly, and, and uh, to, uh, to uh, I, I knew I was going to do this, who have I not said? Uh, Kelly, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly I, 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 I know I must not do this. Uh, I, you have been wonderful. Thank you for, for uh, putting us together. Amanda, thank you for being here, Diane. And thank you for all of you who have participated. Uh, a wonderful event. And, and I, I hope to keep this conversation going. Thank you. And good night. <laughs>